Well, good morning, everyone. And happy Labor Day weekend for you. It's uh, great to have everybody in worship this morning. I got to imagine my brother-in-law who lives in Florida says September is the month that everybody leaves who lives here year-round and they don't have children in, in, uh, in, uh, in school. So uh, I got to imagine this is, a, this is the, the faithful remnant <laughs> worshiping today, and that's outstanding. My name is Tom Cook. I'm the interim pastor at Siesta Key Chapel, and it's a great privilege to be here. I'll be here probably for about a year or a little more than that as the uh, congregation works through its transition to a, a new minister. So I'm looking forward to getting to know all of you. I meet new people every Sunday. I've been here for a month now. I want to be sure to have you sign the fellowship pad. You'll find it um, in each aisle. Uh, pass that f fellowship pad to uh, one another. And... Uh, I know that the seating is sparse today, but uh, you may not know the person uh, that's sitting in your row, and so you will use this opportunity to get to know him or her. So um, uh, sign that fellowship pad, and also gives us a record of your attendance, and if you're a visitor, to put you on our mailing list and to follow up with your visitation. We're really glad you're here. Uh, speaking of visitors, are, are, are there any visitors who would like to introduce themselves, or does anybody have a guest they'd like to introduce this morning? Yes, Margaret. Deborah, welcome. Welcome, Deborah. And Deborah and I served together in Milwaukee Presbytery along with Margaret uh, a long time ago. And uh, it's a great pleasure to have you here. We had dinner last night. Yes. From Arizona, welcome. It's good to have you in worship with us this morning. But not only is it hot, but it's humid for you. <laughs> okay, are there any others? Okay, and uh, sign that fellowship pad. Uh, please pay attention to the announcements that are in the bulletin. Um, Bethel is not going Tuesday. Uh, we're going on, not going on Monday, but we're going Tuesday. Um, I went last week. It was a great experience, and if you haven't been to Beth Elton to see those ministries, uh, it's a really uh, important ministry in the life of this church and mission in the life of this church. They depend uh, on Siesta Key Chapel in a lot of ways and uh, for our support, and it was great to see the, the good things that they do there. I think that's about it for our announcements. So let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worship. Lord, I will always sing of your constant love. You, at, at all times, I will proclaim your faithfulness. How powerful you are. How great is your strength. Your kingdom is founded in righteousness and justice. Love and faithfulness are, all, are in all that you do. Let us praise the Lord forever. Amen. And amen. Let's pray. O oh, holy God, on this Labor Day weekend, 
we gather as your congregation to worship you, the one who says, come unto me, all who labor and are heavy, uh, heavy laden. We pray, O oh Lord, that you enter into this worship, that you guide it in the ways that you want, that you make our ears open to your word, that you hear our songs of joy, that you call us into worship united by the Holy Spirit, made one in Jesus Christ our Lord. We thank you for this church and for the power of your word. Soften us to the desires of your spirit. Open our ears to the message of the gospel so that we might glorify your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And we have this amazing, remarkable ability as believers in Jesus Christ to open our hearts and our minds, to open our lives literally to Christ and to ask for forgiveness for those times in our lives when we've stumbled, when we've tripped up. And we can come with the total assurance that even as we open our hearts to Christ, that Christ knows what's on our hearts and that we are a forgiven people. And so let's pray together our printed prayer of confession and follow it with our own silent confessions. Let's pray. O oh God of mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to save lost persons. Judge us with love and lift the burden of our sins. We confess that we are twisted with pride. We see ourselves pure when we are stained and great when we are small. We have failed to love, forgotten to be just, and have turned away from your truth. Have mercy, O God, and forgive our sin for the sake of Jesus, your Son, our Savior.
Friends, hear this. If anyone is in Christ, there is new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All this from God. Friends in Christ, we are forgiven. Be reconciled to God. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the be seated. I'd like to invite the kids to come up, please. How are you guys doing this morning? Good. Good. Lena. Hi, JJ. No? Oh, give me a fist bump. Does that feel better now? You feel you want to go to bed again? Well, you know, <laughs> Sunday is a Sabbath day, so maybe you can get a nap afterward. I like to take a nap yep. after worship. No, I'd no. I'd rather stay in bed when it's a school day. Oh, well. <laughs> well, that's not going to happen, JJ, so you might as well get used to it. So um, today's uh, Labor Day weekend. This is the Sunday before Labor Day. Tomorrow's the day we, we recognize all the workers and, and uh, the hard work that they do and and there are, you know, sometimes when we think about that, we think about the, the all big professions and we think about how important they are, but that's not what Labor Day is really for. Labor Day is about uh, those people who work and that we don't always see doing hard work. And so today, um, I want to uh, ask uh, Scott to come down. Scott Pensa, come on down. I want to, I've got, some, I've got something for Scott. Do you, know, you guys know who Scott is? Well, while he's coming down, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's our church custodian or sexton, but this guy does everything. It's just amazing what he does in, in this church to keep things going. And uh, he, you can't do the kind of job that he does without um, having a love for what he does. And I can tell you that Scott loves his job. And uh, he has been working here for 10 years in this church. I think that's pretty amazing. And um, a week ago, it marked his, his 10th anniversary. And uh, uh, the, this week was also his birthday. So he had two big things going on uh, today. But on this Labor Day, I really wanted to recognize the, the work that he does in the work. And so, Scott, um, I'm presenting you with the Golden Broom Award. <laughs> Huh? No, it's Scott. It's his award, uh, the Golden Bloom Award for, for all of the hard work you do oh, at uh, Siesta Key Chapel. I know that you are dedicated. I know that you love this church, and I know that you love the people, and I've learned that in the month that I've been here. And so let's say thanks to Scott for his great work in the life of the church. So, huh? No, you can't leave yet because you've got to pray with us. So, uh, so doing doing. Your work, what does, Scott does when he does his work is he does it for God's purpose. And that goes for, JJ, I'm sorry to say this, but going to school, you go, that's your work, and you do it for God's purpose, Megan. You go to school for God's purpose, that's your work, and it's important to do that and to do it so that you can get the award that will come from doing all of that hard work. Let's say a prayer. Let's hold hands. Dear God, Dear God we thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. And we thank you for all the opportunities, thank you for all the opportunities to, serve you to serve you 
in our work, in our work, and in our school, and in our school, especially for JJ's work in school. <laughs> and right, JJ. For JJ's work in school. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Pray with me, please. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, you are perfect in every way. You are the creator of the universe, ever creating in its revelation. You are the greatest mystery. Even as you spoke to Job, we know you can see the tiniest particle with your word and that you can make the biggest star to shine. We know, O oh Lord, that you speak to us in this worship. Even in the vastness of this creation, you speak to each and every one of us. Even when your voice makes thunder, we know that you can speak to us with a still small voice. On this Labor Day weekend, we give thanks for the deep sense of calling we experience in our lives and for professions like teaching and nursing and administration. We know, Lord, that you call all those who labor and are heavy laden to come to you. And so today, on this Sunday before Labor Day, we pray for those who find themselves in jobs out of necessity who work from one paycheck to another as they support families and find much of their earning going to medical care insurance. We pray, O oh Lord, for justice, that all are treated fairly and paid a living wage so that they may gain pride in what they do to live. In Christ, you chose us for life, to fulfill the purpose of your law, 
to love God, to love neighbor, to love ourselves in the way that generates joy. Let your purpose guide our lives. We pray not only for those who seek to choose life, but for those whom the choices are not always easy. For doctors and hospice workers, for military officers, for government officials and, and law enforcement people. We pray for those struggling with aging and mental illness. For those who feel their only choice is to choose death to end life's pain. We pray for those struggling, struggling against death. Those recovering from surgery, undergoing chemotherapies or radiation therapies who feel as though they must die to live. We pray for victims of gun violence and for our culture that finds entertainment in the kind of violence mimicked in senseless deaths in cities like Chicago and states like Florida. And finally, Lord, hear us as we pray for these concerns in our congregation, for Howard Kaler and for Maureen O'Hara, and for Judy White. And Lord, we lift up our nation as it honored a leader named John McCain. And we pray for the kind of integrity in our nation's leadership that he exemplified. Lord, we know you not only listen to our prayers, but astonishingly, you actively participate in them. We know you are always open to this conversation and you want to be part of it. We know that no prayers go unanswered. And so that's how we pray this prayer. We pray that you listen to us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us now present to God our gifts and our offerings and the commitment of our very selves. Pani 
Dominus Angelicus, fit panis hominum, dat panis celicus figoris terminum. Ares mirabilis, Manducat Dominum, Pauper, Pauper, Servus et homilis. Pauper, Pauper, Servus, Servus et humilis. Oh Lord, what we bring to you this day is a sign of our commitment to you and our faith, and we pray, O oh Lord, that you bless these gifts to your purpose, that they might serve through the ministries of this church in a world that needs to hear your word. Allow it to be an opportunity for us to change lives with the gospel of Jesus Christ, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to shorten up our first scripture lesson, um, the Old Testament lesson, which is in uh, Genesis chapter 12. I'm only going to read the first paragraph because I'm going to sell a little bit of this and I'm going to buy a little more in the New Testament. Is that okay? And uh, so we'll, we'll just go with this first paragraph in this lesson. And this is a story of Abram. Now, Abram is the man who would become Abraham, um, along with his wife, who is Sarai, who became Sarah in, in the Old Testament. We all know the story of Abraham and Sarah, and they're having a, a child when Abraham, Abraham was over 100, and, and Sarah was in her 90s. Now, can you imagine what your financial planner would have to say about that? if that would happen. Um, so uh, this is God's word as it comes to us from the Old Testament. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. That ends this morning's first lesson. Seek ye first 
This morning's New Testament lesson uh, comes to us from the book of Acts, and I'm reading from chapter 3, and I'm going to um, go all the way down through 16, so listen to this God's word. This is the story of Peter and John healing the lame man on the steps of the temple. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. A man, and a man lame from birth, has, was being carried in. And people would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and he raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder. That's where that word ekplesio, ekpleso is in the Greek, which really means they were astonished. They were struck out of their bodies. Remember, I talked about that last week, that the word astonish in Greek means to be literally struck out of your body. They were astonished and uh, filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. And while he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's portico, utterly astonished. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people, You Israelites, why do you wonder at this, or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety that we made him walk? 
the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob and the God of our ancestors has glorified his servant, Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. But you rejected the holy and righteous one and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Well, this is the word of the Lord. Let's pray just for a few moments. Well, Lord, I ask that the words of my mouth and meditations that we offer this morning might be acceptable to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So on this Labor Day weekend, let's consider how God does astonishing things through everyday people. We know that God does astonishing things. That's in the God wheelhouse. We know that God is forever enter, entering into our lives and kind of blowing us away. We see that in Scripture. And most of all, we see this in the messiness of our incarnational faith and the miracle of resurrection, which are straight up proof of, of this stru struck out of body, astonishing things that God is capable of doing for us and in our lives. They are the foundation for our belief, teaching us that, that resurrected life can be, can be lived right now. It's a gift that empowers us to do anything in God's name for God's purpose, assured that never will we be defeated, ultimately. Oh yeah, there's going to be battles lost, but the war, the, the long gain will always be there. We know that because of the resurrection, no stumble, no fall, no failure, not even death itself can, can defeat us as resurrected people. It's the core of what we believe. And what could be more astonishing than that? Our destiny is determined as a salvation people. That's what we believe as Presbyterians. We know where we're going. I'm reminded of a great story I, re I read um, that that points to the privilege that we have of living as a resurrected people. And the story's about a Buddhist monk who, who wanted to do something new, and so he signed up to lead a Christian retreat. And so as he prepared for the Christian retreat, he, he decided that he was going to read the whole gospel. And so he read through the gospel before the retreat, and when he gathered all the folks in that meeting, he said to them, I have read your New Testament, and I found it to be an absorbing book, especially the passages that speak of Christ's resurrection and the resurrection promise to his followers. Why can I not see this in you? If you believe in the resurrection, it should change the way you walk The way you hold your bodies it should change the look in your eyes. It should even be the way, change the way you hold your pencil. What an astonishing gift we've been given by God and, and how we see it through the perspective of a Buddhist who has read the New Testament. It should change our whole lives. To live as a people who not only have this gift of resurrection, but because of this gift, we can live as though we can and will do astonishing things. 
If you believe in the resurrection, it should change the way you walk, the way you hold your bodies, the look in your eyes, even the way you hold a pencil. Indeed, God does astonishing things through ordinary people. And we gain insight into this in the scriptures that we've read this morning from Genesis and from the book of Acts. What, what's astonishing about scripture is that the people that God chooses throughout scripture, what, the people that God chooses to work through, these people, these people are, are just really ordinary, clay-footed, fragile people who, who are trying to walk their way through their lives in quirky ways. People with clay feet, fallen and risen forever in their lives. Frederick Buechner describes the quirkiness of biblical characters of the people that God chooses to do amazing things in a book called Peculiar Treasures. And I love this quote. And it opens my eyes to how God works through ordinary people. He says, what struck me more than anything else is as I reacquainted myself with this remarkable rag bag of people was both their extraordinary aliveness and their power to make me feel somehow alive myself for having known them. Have you ever had that experience where you've, you've been with somebody that you've met and you just felt alive because you had the experience of being in their presence? And he went on to say, even across the centuries, they still have the power to bring tears to my eyes and send shivers up my spine. And more besides, saints and scoundrels, nabobs and nobodies, they galvanize all the pages that they appear on. Well, our first story in Genesis recalls God choosing Abram and Sarai, an ordinary childless nomadic couple they weren't able to have children. Her womb was closed for some reason. Yet inconceivably, God chose them to be the root for the gene pool of a great nation. And he said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And from there, our personal faith narrative takes root and blossoms as God's people. Abram becomes Abraham, and Sarai becomes Sarah, and he and Sarah bear a son named Isaac or Isaac. When Abraham is 100 years old and Sarah is in her 90s and well past menopause, this is the family line through which Christ would enter the world. Abraham rooted in the ordinariness and the messiness of his life, warts and all, did astonishing things obedient to God. Acts tells a story of the church's infancy. And you all know I love the book of Acts by now. And our scripture takes place only a few days after Pentecost. Peter and, and the rest of his disciples have spent time with the resurrected Jesus, training and preparing and, and to take this gospel out into the world, really not understanding what that meant because they were just Galilean Jews. And, and then they witnessed Jesus ascend up to heaven and then there was Pentecost and this Holy Spirit that grabbed hold of them and suddenly they were speaking in languages they'd never even heard of. And they experienced powerful changes in their lives that compelled them to take the good news beyond Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria and out to the ends of the earth. And this becomes the compelling story of this book, which is really the acts of the Holy Spirit as the church starts its expansion from the epicenter of Jerusalem and expands literally out to the, to the ends of the earth. And when we meet Peter and John at this point in the story, they're headed up to the temple for afternoon prayers. They did this every day when they were in Jerusalem. Approaching the temp temple gate, there's a beggar there who catches their attention. He's been there all the time. They've just looked past him, but a beggar catches his attention, and, and he's a man who's been crippled his entire life, and he's been placed in that spot daily by his family. 
so that he can beg for alms. You know the usual scene when passers-by look beyond the beggar. You go to any city and you know this experience. You go down Michigan Avenue in Chicago and beggars are in every corner just about. If you go to the intersections of Sarasota or go down to First Watch on, on a Saturday afternoon, I saw it. There are beggars on the corner standing, panhandling, hoping that you'll just give them a gift or the leftovers from your meal. But we've hardened ourselves to them so we can look past them, beyond them, so, so they don't disturb us. Well, people in biblical times treated beggars the same way as most of us do today. They looked over or through them like they were invisible. And the beggar routinely avoids looking at the passers-by, not wanting to build up hope that just... Something might happen. And it's our impasse toward poverty's injustice. And our behavior helps harden us and to ignore poverty and the disparity of our economics right in the midst of us. The lame man calls out to Peter and John. They call him to look at them eye to eye. Look at me. And heart to heart. And he's not prepared for this attention. All he wants is a couple of coins. He's embarrassed. But then he looked at them. Peter says, I don't have a nickel to my name. But what I have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. And I can hear the voices in the beggar's head saying, yeah, sure, buddy, and then let's all stop the sun from setting. Just give me a couple of coins. That's all I'll, I want. And Peter grabbed him by the hand and he pulled him up, pulled him, pulled, grabbed him by the right hand and pulled him up and his feet and his ankles, they straightened up and they were made strong in that moment. And I'm guessing the beggar must have had what I, I knew when I was a kid growing up as, as club feet. And then the man took to walking like a duck takes to water. And in fact, he began dancing and he began leaping and praising God like he was a winner on the world of dance. The story says the people were utterly astonished out of their body experience out of body experiences by seeing what was happening these ordinary Galilean fishermen had done this incredible thing on the temple steps without hesitation Peter claims this as a teaching moment and he evangelizes people of Israel why does this surprise you why do you stare at us as if by our own power or godliness, we made this man walk. It was done in the name of Jesus to glorify God. Peter's miracle made real God's ability to do astonishing things through two ordinary fishermen from Galilee and a lame beggar. Well, the people were stirred. In fact, the story says many who heard Peter and John believed, and this annoyed the temple rulers who heard about it, and later they arrested Peter and John and the healed man, and they called him on the carpet. And the three stood before the temple leaders who two months before had orchestrated Jesus' execution, and we forget about how all this time is compressed in that. It was only two months or less since they had crucified Jesus. And so they're called on the carpet before these people who had orchestrated Jesus' resurrection. And they said, by what power have you done this? By what power have you done this healing? Peter says, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified whom God raised 
from the dead. And the leaders were astonished. They were dumbstruck. They didn't know what to do with him. These articulate men were ordinary, unschooled Galilean fishermen who spoke in an uneducated dialect, and yet they noted they were the followers of Jesus of Nazareth, and the leaders of the first church status quo were in a conundrum. This Jesus person wouldn't go away. Even after nailing him to the cross and burying him, he continued to gnaw at their power to hold on to their people. In the name of Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit, ordinary people can do astonishing things. What a profound message that is for us at Siesta Key Chapel. Yet really it's the same message that Jesus proclaimed throughout his, God, his life. All things are possible through God. Remember, as heirs to the astonishing miracle of resurrection, we are heirs to the power of God to do astonishing things. Oh, sure, there will be times when we fail. Sure, there will be opportunities lost. Sure, there will be times when our planning just wasn't good enough to make something work. But God continues to call us to do astonishing things by faith. as citizens in God's new realm. And that's who we are. When we become followers of Jesus Christ, we're given a new passport in God's new realm. As citizens in God's new realm, God empowers us to do astonishing, miraculous things, even though we may be unschooled, undereducated, in the specifics of an enlightened faith, ordinary people, with God's word, we can make the lame to walk, we can make the blind to see, we can feed the hungry, certainly, we can clothe the naked, we know we can do that, we have the capability of doing that, we can stand up and we can witness for justice, we can proclaim the peace of God, we can hold fast against evil and defeat injustice by faith. We know this. This week I visited Bethel Ministries with four others from our church. Every week, every week, two days a week, Monday and Tuesday, people from this church go down to Bethel Ministries. They drive an hour down to Waimama, Florida to serve the people on the margins of life. These folks are in many ways the lame man on the temple steps. They're the invisible poor in our lives, many of whom come to the U.S., some legally, some illegally, to work 12-hour days, six days a week in fields in seasonal work backbreaking work at minimum wage with no overtime or benefits. And their work, they are the working poor and they're dependent on seasonal work so that you and I can pay the prices we pay at places like Publix for our produce. They are invisible to us where they live in Waimama, Florida. Bethel Ministries is directed by a Presbyterian minister, Kathy Dane, who will be preaching here on World Communion Sunday. And I think she preached here last July as well, and a remarkable woman. Bethel and all of its workers and all of its volunteers are ordinary people. They really are just ordinary people doing astonishing things for people in need. On Tuesday, we packed and distributed around 500 bags of groceries, one bag per family. And the count was down, they think, because there had been a car accident in front of the entrance of Bethel Ministries, and the police were there, and that would keep many of the workers away because of their immigration status.
They're about to open a dental clinic. They have a building and equipment already, and they're dreaming of a medical clinic to serve these folks who serve us in many ways to provide us with the inexpensive food that we have, that we enjoy. I was astonished to discover that a member of our congregation purchases all the beans and the rice for that pantry. Bethel depends on faithful churches and ordinary people like the people of Siesta Key Chapel to do astonishing things to help those who are otherwise invisible. Bethel offers just a taste of the astonishing things I think that this congregation does. This is a congregation that loves its mission. I know that. I learned that when I interviewed here. And its members together and as individuals are able to provide folks with a, just a glimpse, just a peak at least of, of the incarnational resurrection power of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. There is so much more we can do and so much more that needs to be done. If we would live like, like our lives like that Buddhist leader at the Christian retreat, live like the resurrection has changed us, changed the way we walk, the look in our eyes, the way we hold ourselves, even the way we hold our pencil, and the way we serve the poor. With God, you can do astonishing things. See us to Key Chapel and people of Christ. That's the gospel's message. And this is the good news for this day. This day. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, holy God, you astonish us. Not only with what you do, but with what the saints do in our very midst. Miraculous things. Feeding the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the sick. Help us, O oh Lord, to live as resurrected people. In the name of Jesus. Amen. come to the lake shore looking neither for wealthy nor wise ones you only asked me to follow humbly oh lord with your eyes you have searched me and while smiling have spoken my name now my boat's left on the shoreline behind me by your side i will seek other seas you know so well my possessions my boat carries no gold and no weapons. You will find there my nets and labor. 
searched me and while smiling have spoken my name now my boats left on the shoreline behind me by your side I will seek other seas you need my hands full of caring through my labors to give others rest and constant love that keeps on loving oh lord with your eyes you have searched me and while smiling have spoken my name now my boats left on the shoreline behind me by your side i will seek other seas you who have fished other oceans ever longed for by souls who are waiting my loving friend as thus you call me oh lord with your eyes you have searched me and while smiling have spoken my name now my boats left on the shoreline behind me by your side i will seek other seas friends go now into the world in peace and strive to learn the language of the heart and may the grace of our lord jesus christ the love of god the fellowship of the holy spirit be yours this day and forevermore. Amen. We leave surrounded by beauty to respond, grow, and proclaim. We serve and love one another in Christ our Savior's name. Our Savior's name.